workers, you're not allowed to use the fireplaces, so they're purely decorative, so you don't have to go to the expense of putting in new gas, you know, flues and all sorts of things. So you just really go in and you tart them up. Um, and look, you know, if you find that your fireplace is missing some bits and pieces, um, I would suggest that you buy, like jump on eBay as an exercise, you know, jump on eBay in the next week, type in fireplace inserts, fireplace surround, you pick these things, sorts of things up for like 70, 80, 100 dollars. Um, so they're always next to nothing on, on sites like eBay. So they're very quick and easy to restore. You go to Bunnings, you buy a tin of black heatproof paint, you paint the surround. Um, you don't even really have to buy the heatproof paint because it's, you know, you're not going to light them up anyway, um, but just for the cast iron. And um, basically the timber surround, you paint that up gloss white and they look absolutely beautiful. So I've got that example um, at Leichhardt to show you um, once fireplace that hasn't been restored, one that has. Okay, remove old fireplaces. Quite often um, with your fireplaces, sometimes you'll, you know, particularly like semis and things like that, where you've got a long hallway down the front, you've got, you know, bedroom one, you might have um, bedroom two, a bath, like that, you go, you've got a lounge room, so then it goes into like that sort of thing where you've got a lounge room and a kitchen to the rear, okay? Quite often they'll have a, uh, you know, they might have a fireplace on this wall, like coming down the hallway, and you come in as a renovator and you might put a second story on the top of that semi or whatever it may be, or the terrace, and you suddenly convert that into a, um, decide, you know, put a wall in there and convert that into bedroom three. And what it does, it starts to impact on your floor space. So sometimes you actually have to take out, um, if you're going to come through and change layouts, a disjointed layout, or add some extra bedrooms in, sometimes you're actually, it would pay to actually take, remove that fireplace out and actually just utilise that space as more functional area as well. Okay, so don't be afraid to rip it out. Um, obviously, if you rip it out, then you're obviously going to have to fix the roof, patch, um, make good the roof as well. Okay, install ducted air conditioning to um, your main living room. So again, if you've got a low budget property, um, you're not going to be installing ducted air. You're probably going to be installing ceiling fans, um, a split system air conditioner or ducted air conditioning for more expensive. It is an expectation that with more expensive properties, I, I tend to think anything over a million dollars these days, it is almost an expectation that buyers have ducted air conditioning. So again, it's relative to what is the value of the property that you're going to be reselling. Um, kitchens. Okay, you're going to be dealing with these sorts of kitchens, all right? Now, um, I guess as renovators, the first point of call is you should always ask yourself the question, can I salvage the kitchen? Um, quite often the doors, are, like look at this kitchen. This kitchen is actually in perfect condition structurally. It's just whoever decided to install green and black um, cupboards, you know, didn't really have too much design skills but or colour coordination. So, But structurally, this kitchen is really fine. So what I was doing is, it, what I would do is if I was renovating this kitchen is I would come in and resurface the doors. I'd either paint them, depending on the value of the property, or I'd take the doors off and take them to a cabinet maker to be resurfaced, okay? If it's a low-budget property, like a $300,000 house in Wagga Wagga, I'd be inclined to paint them. If this was a $2 million house in Leichhardt, I'd be inclined to take the doors off and get them totally resurfaced. So quite often the internal carcass, the white melamine carcass, can be quite good and you go in and change the doors. Um, this was that, ha that, that kitchen in Tempe. Um, I mean, this is just the sort of stuff you're going to be dealing with, okay? So, and look at this again, you know, Nanny's Kitchen, perfectly fine, perfectly functional. Um, all the cupboards are a beautiful structural condition, so all you need to do is just come through and paint, resurface, and they'll look entirely different and change the bench tops. So always try and salvage where you can. Okay, there's really great design software that you can buy for kitchen renovations and bathroom renovations. Uh, I do, it's team, uh, Jules, Camille, can we find that software somewhere so we can pass it around? Um, so basically, you can buy this software from Harvey Norman, it's about $80, and it's basically like architectural, like sort of a dumbed down version of CAD drawing. And what it does, it gives you the ability to see the, um, your designs. So it's really easy, just plonk in the dimensionments of the room and you can start inserting cabinets and stuff. And what it does, it gives you the ability to sort of actually put yourself like a real life situation so you can see actually how it looks in real life before it's built. So quite often I do that. It doesn't take very long, like an hour to do that. And that's what I give to my cabinet makers. I say, look, this is a concept that I'm aiming for. Okay, so kitchens, make the kitchen bigger. Your objective with your renovations is to make your kitchen as big as possible. Big kitchens have high perceived value. Out of the whole area of a property, where you want to spend your money is in the kitchen, okay? The kitchen and the bathrooms are the two biggest areas that add value. As a general rule, 2% of the purchase price is your budget for a kitchen. So if you're buying a house, an unrenovated house for 500,000, what's your kitchen budget? 2%, which is what? 
10 grand. So that's 2%. That covers everything, your cabinets, your bench tops, your labor, everything. Okay, your lighting, you name it, that's it. Any dollar you spend over that, you're overcapitalizing. So these are just like some of the, these ones that I bought recently. Um, I use this all the time, but I can't, um, they've just changed it, you know, in the last couple of years and it's not so great anymore. But um, these are the ones that you can buy from Harvey Norman. So I'll pass these around. So you can get ones just for general interior design. So, you, you know, if you want to be doing this as a full-time business, it's probably worth the investment. But yeah, they're just like kitchen designs. So it, on the back of these, um, it, you can insert cabinets, um, cooktops, ovens, all sorts of things and then you can fly around and see it in real life so if it doesn't look quite right on screen then you can actually change things so you can you can model kitchens so I'll pass those around um, and have a look but yeah you can buy all those sorts of things at the moment it just help okay so bigger kitchens that's where possible so what I look to do is um, you're going to come across a lot of houses where they just have really small um, you know small layouts so again you've got you know, hallway down the middle, one, two, you know, bedroom like that, B1, B2, bath, B3. And quite often with a lot of unrenovated houses, they'll have a kitchen like in the back, you know, quite often they have them like that and they'll have a bathroom. A lot of houses have bath there and a kitchen there and then they'll have a lounge room there or they'll have the lounge room up here and another bedroom down there, just really disjointed layouts. So in those situations, what I'd basically do is um, I would leave all of that to the front and I'd come through... You know, I put a nice, you know, galley style kitchen through there, depending on the value of the property, or I'd come through and I'd do a, you know, a, a, like a, a U shape, something through there, a much more substantial lounge room, and basically a set of bifold doors from the back. So if you're really smart about your design, guys, what you do is you're going to aim for less in your renovations. What you want to do is you want to come in and take out all these internal walls and stuff, create all this open plan living at the rear, because from a construction point of view, um, all you're really building is that 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 and the roof over it rather than having all these rooms that do this and that and the laundry and the cupboard there and this and that so that all every time you insert a wall in a house that's costing you extra money because you've got a timber stud you've got plasterboard you've got skirting boards you've got architraves you've got painting all sorts of things so be very simple with your designs okay people truly do love this open plan concept and as for you as renovators it means you're going to be able to actually construct your projects a lot smarter and a lot cheaper just through having smart design The next picture you've got is a coffer ceiling. <laughs> yeah, there, that one. <laughs> Which one? It, back or the no, that one? Yes. Yes, you're exactly right. Okay. Uh, this is a kitchen I did in Pimble. This was a, you can't, it's very deceiving from the photo, but that's an eight metre galley style kitchen. So my cookie cutter approach is galley style kitchens. They work quite well. That whole kitchen cost me $20,000 and I had double ovens, double, um, double ovens, double microwaves, whatever it was, um, double wine fridges. So you can really uh, get your kitchens for a lot less money. Um, as from now, you need to start shopping at cabinet makers. No longer as professional renovators are you to go and shop at those kitchen showrooms. They're for the weekend warriors who don't know what they're doing. So um, what you need to do is you need to start going straight to a cabinet maker. Um, basically what happens is you've got cabinet makers who basically actually make the cabinets and then kitchen showrooms normally once you go into a kitchen showroom, the retail showroom, they just pass the job onto the cabinet maker. Quite often you'll say to the kitchen showrooms, do you have your own factory? And they'll say yes, and they don't. Um, so you just got to cut out that middleman and go straight to the cabinet maker. So your cabinet maker can do everything for you. Your kitchen cabinets, your bathroom cabinets, your wardrobe, any storage cabinets. It's a one-stop shop. And obviously the more cabinets you order through them, the cheaper it's going to be for you in terms of your pricing. Okay, so I'll quickly keep moving through. Install a new kitchen in holes. So quite often the kitchens are just going to be completely gone. You know, definitely a new kitchen adds phenomenal value to a property. So you've just got to make sure that um, it's all relative to the value of the property. This is a um, kitchen that I just did in the, in the January renovation that I did. This kitchen in total with the appliances was $6,000. Yep. 
So the cabinets were like 3,800, had the slightly thicker bench tops, so the stone. And then all of those appliances you see there were bought from Bunnings. So the cooktop, the oven, the range hood was bought for about $1,500. It was um, you know, a 340000 low budget house. So that's where you don't need to go and buy these fancy designer appliances because you're not going to get your money back. So yeah, if you really shop around, you get a good cabinet. So I suggest you all use my cabinet maker. He understands the whole renovating for profit system. Um, and you know, I said to him, I will pass a lot of business for you if you look after my customers. So he's very, very good. And he's actually going to come in tomorrow. So you can um, hammer him then. Okay. Uh, just in New South Wales, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Paint cupboard doors. Um, look at this kitchen here. It's an okay kitchen. It's perfectly livable. Some of you probably have houses at the moment have, that have these timber style kitchens. But see how it's a little bit dated? So structurally fine, just a little bit dated. So painting those cupboards with um, a lighter color paint will brighten that kitchen up beyond belief. Okay, so you're going to be dealing with these sorts of things. Okay, paint before, after, paint. Okay, um, change kitchen cupboards. Okay, so again, you can just change the actual cupboard doors, leave the carcass, change the kitchen doors. That works a treat in these low budget cosmetic renos in the outer areas as well. Not so prevalent for the inner city areas where there's a higher expectation for quality. Um, change bench tops. We're going to go in where the, the bench top is just worn. So get in your cab. Who does this? Cabinet maker. Cabinet maker you can do it, or you can just get your stone mason. If you want a stone bench top like Caesar stone, that's called a stone mason. Okay, so that was before, after. Okay, add thicker bench tops. As you start to move into more expensive properties, it's nicer if you do add th thicker bench tops. My cookie cutter approach is 60 mil stone. It is an additional expense. You won't be using 60 mil stone if you're renovating a $400,000 house. So again, relative to the spend. But what thicker bench tops too is they just make the kitchen look more substantial. So they're very appropriate as you start to notch into more expensive properties. Okay, replace the stove, oven and cooktop. So that's a big thing in a kitchen renovation. Install a range hood. Okay, add a double sink. Who's got a single sink at home? How frustrating is it? You can't wash the bubbles off um, the stuff, off your plates and stuff like that. So um, adding a double sink into a renovation, into your new kitchen will definitely add value. Add a dishwasher. A lot of people want a dishwasher. A lot of people don't have a dishwasher. You don't need to spend a lot of money. The reality is you can pick up a dishwasher these days for four to $600. You'll find that always go the stainless steel route, not the white dishwashers. Stainless steel has higher perceived value than the white appliances. And now everybody is buying the stainless steel. So it's quite often cheaper to buy stainless steel than the white ones now just because of the economy of scale. Okay, so there you go, the stainless steel appliance. So insta always install stainless steel appliances right through your whole kitchen renovation. Okay, now cooktops. You can upgrade your appliances from 60 to 90 centimetre appliances. They also have some brands in 70 centimetre appliances. Now, where this can be particularly useful is um, if you are starting to do more expensive renovations in properties over a million dollars, and if room allows, I would suggest you actually do upgrade to 90 centimetre appliance because people will place a higher value on those. You don't don't need to go and buy expensive designer appliances. In fact, even with my high value renovations to this day, I still do not use high value. Like um, I've never used Gaganau or you know even uh, Mill or you know those sorts of brands. So what I look for, what's more important to me, is what looks good. So you can buy a lot of fake clones of the more expensive copies with your appliances as well. So what I look for is um, you can buy some unbranded products as well. You don't want. Sometimes you get some really cheap brand names, and you can tell they're really cheap. They look, they sound horrible like Jeffney or something like some weird name like that and buyers will look at that but sometimes you can buy some unbranded cooktops that just have a beautiful stainless steel cooktop with no branding and plonk that in and that will do the job so you can either spend fifteen thousand dollars for your appliances or you can spend six thousand dollars and use that nine thousand dollars somewhere else and buying some beautiful lights whatever it may be okay install a breakfast bar who's got a breakfast bar at their home does everybody, when they come over your house, where do they sit? The breakfast bar. I don't know what it is about a breakfast bar, but um, it's, it definitely adds value to a property and it can be done very cheaply. So when you're designing your kitchens, always allow an overhang of at least three to four um, millimetres for a breakfast bar. And you're just taking an unusable space and you're actually making it into a usable space that people will value. Also, when it comes to styling, it will give you the opportunity to put some funky little stools there and make buyers see that is a practical area. Okay, sometimes uh, you can install an island unit into your kitchen. So in examples where you've got, uh, you, like you might have a, where you have no opportunity to be able to um, 
uh, you know, squeeze in a bigger kitchen because the walls and things are there. It's really off on that one. Thank you. Um, you know, so you're coming down your hallway. That's your bedrooms and your hallway down there. So you've got a kitchen. You might, you know, might have something like that. It's really off. Um, so opportunity for you that potentially come in and just install an island unit right in the middle there if you can't actually change the layout in any other way, shape or form. Okay. Add an island bench for extra space. I think that's actually the same thing. Might be a double up. Um, or oh, same picture. Okay, conceal appliances behind cabinetry. Now, I do this all the time. Have you seen these kitchens uh, where this is one of my kitchens in one of my early renos where um, the actual fridge is concealed behind the cabinetry? What it does is when you conceal your fridge behind the cabinetry, so it's an extra door and an integration kit, but what it does, it actually makes it look like you've got a much bigger kitchen. Okay, looks like you've got more cabinets than what you really do, therefore high perceived value. So again, low budget renos, not applicable. As you start to move into some more expensive properties, you would definitely do it. Um, even on the cosmetic renovation that I did in January on the $340,000 place, I still did, um, I still concealed the door. It just makes the kitchen look so much nicer. So I would always aim for that. Now you don't always have to put the integration kit and in fact I, um, in my renovations I don't use the integration kit which is basically you only open one door and it takes the fridge door with you. So quite often in my renovations you've got to open two doors. Most people go, oh that doesn't sound good but you know what, after you use it, I've actually got it in my own personal house at the moment and you, don't, it, you just don't notice it. So it's no big issue and it just makes the kitchen look so much nicer and so much bigger. Okay. If you can try and even get to a standard cookie cutter template, even with some of your supplies like your cabinet maker, so you do a certain style of kitchen and they just know, but just what it means is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you work with a different tradie. Okay, install home appliance. Now, a, a, a very trendy thing in kitchen renovations these days is to install a home appliance centre. Do you know what that is? It's basically like a cupboard that hides your toaster and your kettle and milkshake maker, whatever you've got. It hides all those sort of ugly appliances that can look bad. So that is a, um, a thing that's rather trendy in a lot of um, renovations, particularly more expensive homes these days as well. Okay, add wow appliances. Um, you can get wow appliances for your kitchen. Could you think of what any of those might be? Yep, wine fridge, espresso, um, integrated coffee machine is definitely a wow because a lot of them, like mine has um, blue neon lights on, it looks quite nice. Um, uh, water dispensers with fresh filtered water. Um, kit, some of mine are the kitchen scales. Um, see these kitchen scales? Everybody, I, can, I know how successful, in my, I did a lot of this in my early days, and I always knew how successful a, um, an open for inspection was by the number of fingerprints on the kitchen scales. People come up, people love gadgets. They'll come up and they'll go, what is that? And basically, you know, you have a little selling card that say it's integrated scale. So it costs about $400, it's a gadget. Um, your stonemason cuts a hole in the, the bench and just plonks it straight in. So it just, it's just those sort of little things that um, can just make your kitchen look a lot, not, you know, a lot better than what it was. The reality is nobody will ever probably use it, but it doesn't matter. It looks good, all right? Okay. With the pantry, I'm um, sorry, with the kitchen, would you add a butler's pantry in? It seems very in vogue in Melbourne at the moment with your yeah. high-end renos. Yeah, absolutely. So there's an opportunity for you. Um, sometimes you're going to deal with um, kitchens where you have your sort of kitchen through there and you might have a laundry. Like sometimes you buy properties where the laundry is sort of like that through the kitchen, whatever it may be. Or what you can do is, yeah, you can have your kitchen through here so you don't design your cabinets like that. So what I would do is if this, and like, so sometimes you have a lot, a lot of laundries piggyback on the back of kitchens. Have you ever noticed that? Because yep. uh, they, they basically locate all the, when they're designing the house, but they, all the water lines are together. So typically your kitchen, your bathroom and your laundry tend to be in very close proximity. So you might have a laundry through there. So what I'd do is I'd actually chop the laundry in half. So I'd, I'd potentially do that. And, you know, you know, with laundry, you only really need a bench. A washing machine goes on one end and a bench. And what I would do is I'd utilise all of that space for basically walk-in pantry. So that's where it's really useful to cut back your laundry space to create, because people will place a value on that walk-in pantry. Because nothing worse than having a pantry where all your stuff is just shoved behind a deep cupboard that you can't get to on high shelves. So people love those walk-in things. So, yeah, definitely. Does that answer your question? Yep, beautiful. Okay. Um, bathrooms, let's look, at, let's look at bathrooms. Um, bathrooms, these are sorts of yeah, bathrooms that you're going to be dealing with, okay? Don't get scared, don't freak out. Um, look, there's one. 
<laughs> now, <laughs> you love it? I love it. I'm not going to make money yet. <laughs> If you want to hear a funny story, I went through this property, I went through an inspection about a month ago. It's this house in North Street, Balmain, and uh, every, it was like a house like this, you know, thing, and every single room on the bed, there was a dolly, <laughs> and this dolly was like there, and I was walking through the agents, I went through the first room, I saw this big dolly looking at me, and I'm walking down the hallway, go to the next bedroom, they'll be like, another dolly on the bed, <laughs> I'm like, Okay, and then you go to another bedroom. I think it's like three bedroom house and there's another dolly. And I said to, to Chris, the real estate agent, I said, I feel like that dolly is just going to go, Chucky, yes. oh, <laughs> you buy this house, I, I'll haunt you forever. Um, so yeah, it's uh, open for inspections. Like, these sorts of properties, they make you laugh. Like this is like really the fun part because you just see the funny things out there. Um, so the reality is this is an absolutely horrible bathroom, but you know what? There is one thing that would change this bathroom in the space of two hours. Spray. You can come in, you can bring the resurfaces in. <laughs> what did he say? Tell me. Dynamite. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a problem when your AB guy is smarter than you. Um, so, what, yeah, the tile resurfaces. So, what they do is they come in and they're space suits, they tape it all up, they, put, they basically tape the front door, they would spray that whole lot. Because look at those tiles, they are in perfect condition. So, if this was a low budget cosmetic reno, this is where you'd keep all the tiles, you'd bring the tile resurfaces in, you'd spray the tiles, you'd spray the bath, you'd spray the floor. They can even spray like the vanity. Sometimes this might be, look at this, that's okay. They can even spray the vanity. So that's where you don't need to spend a lot of money. It can be done within a matter of hours. So, yeah. Okay. So install a new bathroom. Obviously, if your budget allows and if the property warrants that investment, then definitely install a new bathroom. Um, on average, your spend for your bathroom is 2% of the purchase price. So if you bought a house for a million dollars, you're going to be spending, uh, what is it? 10, uh, 20,000. 20, 20, no, not 40 grand. 20,000 on your bathroom renovation. So that's a good rule of thumb. Most bathrooms, yeah, you can definitely get a bathroom done cheaper than that. But um, that's a general rule of thumb. For a million dollar purchase price, you know, 20,000 for everything your fixtures, your fittings, your labor, your materials, everything. You're giving me looks of shock. Oh, absolutely. But that's a general rule. So the reality is you could build that bathroom for 10 grand if you really wanted to. You just want to make sure your bathroom reflects the value of the home. But that's a general rule of thumb. Sorry, a quick question back to the kitchens. Mm -hmm. Would you replace an electric cooktop with gas? Would you spend the money and put gas in? Do you believe it's... Um, I think people like gas, but if it's going to be major expense, that's not going to return you any value, I don't feel. So if you've got the option to do it cheaply, yeah, I'd say, you know, probably do that. But yeah... Okay, so it's, yeah, okay, cool. All right. Hi, with the 2% on the bathroom, is that for all bathrooms, like 2% each, or just 2% of your purchase price on your ensuite and your main bathroom? It's normally typically per bathroom. So if you, I mean, but you don't want to spend 40 grand on two bathrooms, obviously. So if it's a smaller ensuite, look, the reality is you can get a bathroom done, even like low budget cosmetic renos um, bathroom, you can redo them, really do them for about three or $4,000 if you're very frugal with your spending. Um, even in the bathrooms that I do these days, they typically cost me around 15 to 20%, uh, 15 to 20,000. But I'm doing high-end bathrooms with stone bars and all that sort of stuff. So the average bathroom cost is somewhere between eight to eight to thirteen thousand on average for most normal homes. Yep. Okay. Convert a bedroom into a bathroom. So this is what I do. What I do is basically when I'm modeling my floor plans, I actually convert a bathroom, a bedroom into a bathroom. So what it does, it starts to differentiate my property against all the other properties on the market, um, particularly in the suburbs that I focus on. There's a lot of small pokey bathrooms. So by converting it into a bedroom, a, a bedroom into a bathroom, buyers come through my properties and they go, wow, this is an absolute huge bathroom. So I pay a lot of attention to this as a renovator and I make sure that my kitchens and my bathrooms are a 
a lot bigger than the average in my suburb and for some reason I've done, done particularly well because it just seems I'm different my properties are different and unique on the market so I guess if you can try and make your properties unique and different in every way it's just going to mean you, it's going to be easier to snag a buyer at the end okay I need to keep moving through quickly okay install new cabinetry so when your bathrooms install new cabinets so you take out the old vanity you install new new cabinets okay resurface or install new tiles um, so again you bring the spray painters in so these are the sorts of things you can get the tradies in that can quote on and this is where you don't have to rip out retile fix patch make good it's very easy to get in for stuff that's structurally fine okay install a bath a lot of homes don't have a bath Okay, or they have some, po you know, those little bars where they have them underneath the shower. Absolutely horrible. So women always want a bath. And you've also got to think as renovators, you're going to be targeting families and assume that little kids, you know, little kids, my daughter won't get a shower. It's, it's a bath every single day. Doesn't like getting water on her hair. So you've got to think practically about the people who are going to be buying that house and what are their, their particular product needs in the house. So definitely install a bath. If you come across... Um, uh, bathrooms that only have a shower it is perfectly fine to put a shower over a bath okay so that's a great way to utilize space okay resurface the existing bath okay so you certainly can do that install new taps so quite often if I'm doing a low budget cosmetic reno go in and just put fresh taps um, and very square um, very minimal taps you know just not nothing no dolphin heads or anything like that okay um, you know leave that for somebody else's house um, so just very simple taps. Um, this is a great one. Coroma is a great company for bathroom taps. Even on my high-end values, like this shower head, I use consistently, and it's only a couple of hundred dollars. It looks smick, and it's not expensive. So if you, what you'll find as renovators, once you start to identify these little pieces, what you're going to start doing is you're going to start using them for every renovation afterwards. So for me, it's why I've got my cookie cutter. I, every, you know, for me, it's just a, it's a different street address, a different day. It's a production line for me where I use the same thing day renovation day in day out and it just means it frees up my time so I don't have to go hunting for these materials so when you find these little these these pieces that look nice that are cheap you're just going to use them from project to project okay install a double vanity so his and her vanity so whenever I'm doing a bathroom renovation I always look for ways that I can squeeze in two basins not one so that husband and wife boyfriend and girlfriend whatever it may be can use um, basically the bathroom at the same time so like you know very simple things to do again it has high perceived value people just assume so quite often you're going to be buying you, you know you're going to be doing bathroom renovations and a lot of you are going to be dealing with this sort of thing where you know you've got your door here might have a shower through there um, you know they might have a a bath through there actually no can I have the, the rubber thank you actually a lot of renovations you'll find this a lot of them have the vanity right at the front door like as you open the door like that um, a lot of them will have a toilet like that or you know something like that so what you could do in that instance is I always look for ways to make a bigger vanity so if I was dealing with that what I would probably do is you know you've got your door through here I would keep I would reinstall a bath a shower over the bath through there and put a you know glass security screen I would put a uh, toilet through there and I'd make a much you know a much bigger vanity through there his and hers vanity through there like that so you just you know you tweak that's that's all you do is you're going to just you know grab some paper just doodle doodle with layouts and go okay what can I do here um you know can I put a big vanity through there like that you know basically put a toilet down that end like that maybe I can do a look there see that see how that's another example where you can do a bath through there a shower over the bath through there maybe put a little wall in, a little party wall through there so you've got a much bigger bathroom so that's all you're going to do is start doodling like that and that's where you can just you're going to come up with the best solution for your for your reno okay install mirrored shaving cabinets so I'm um, quite often I'll use these sorts of this is um in the low budget reno that I did this year, I installed these um, shaving cabinets. So your cabinet maker can make all of those. And what I like doing is that when I'm doing the strip out of the bathroom, you recess them into the cavity of the wall. You cap you've got a hundred mil cav um, cavity into the wall space, and basically, you know, these cabinets are only like 140 mil. So you've got about 40 mil sticking out. You're just utilising available space. So don't overlook the overlook those opportunities. Um, Cherie, back to the double vanities. Um, would you put that in the main bathroom or an ensuite? Because quite uh, often the en suites are used more. Yeah. Um, if you've got the room, then do it in both. Okay. 
Yep. Okay, install two-person shower. Anybody got a two-person shower at home? Yeah, do you like it? Great way to keep the romance in your relationship. Um, so, yeah, I mean, people love... Um, see, for me, like, you, you're probably thinking I'm being a bit of a deviant or whatever, right? But um, the reality is, is that if you put yourself in the, in the buyer's shoes, you know, p- buyers coming through... Like, if I, was a, if I was a buyer coming in buying a house and I saw two showers in the bathroom, like, done nicely... I would be thinking, hey, maybe if you know this is one thing that could spice up my marriage. Um, so you just got to think. I know it sounds a bit crazy, but people do think those sorts of things. Okay, so just you know, don't overlook the power of those things. Okay, replace the shower screen. Okay, you're just going to be coming through really daggy old shower screens. Um, replace those. Quite often with your renovations, if you're really smart about your design and your renovation. Um, what you can do is you can actually almost minimise the shower screen now these days. So by designing it, like a lot of people put like a, a tile wall up where there's no shower screen. So they'll make the tile wall a little bit deeper and obviously your shower comes and most of your water will come here. So they build it out a little bit bigger. You know, they'll have a bath like that. So behind it and then, you know, a vanity, big vanity through here. Or, you know, toilet in the corner and then basically your his and her vanity through there. So if you're really smart, you can actually minimise through your design. You can actually, you can totally eliminate. And that's a good thing for a buyer because the buyer will come through and they'll see there's no glass and they'll start thinking what? Less cleaning, no cleaning. On the glass, shower screens are a hassle to clean, aren't they? You always get soap, scum and all sorts of stuff. All right, replace the shower curtain. In low budget renos, you're going to be dealing with some horrible shower curtains. So go in and replace the shower curtain with a glass screen, okay? So you can buy those from Bunnings very, very cheaply. I love the glass screens because what they do is they don't block any light. They help your renovation appear lighter and brighter because you're letting light in from the window. There's no um, dark shadows being cast. Um, Particularly for low budget renos, uh, particularly the country areas, you're going to just be dealing with a lot of shower curtains. So take out, rip out the old ugly shower curtain that's got the moss and the fungi and all sorts of things growing on it. We don't know what's going on it. And go in, like pl- places, places like Ikea, Spotlight, Target, sell these cheap shower curtains, really funky ones for like 20, 30 bucks. That's all you need to do. Um, the higher end ones, do you do powder rooms? Um, no. But if I could, I probably would. But um, you mean like just to freshen up? Well, in our... En suite, my wife doesn't want the toilet and the, the vanities in the same room, so we, as we come from our bedroom, we go oh, through yeah. the powder room into yeah. the en suite. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's nice. I mean, um, so what you're sort of saying is this sort of, um, sort of this layout where you might have your big bedroom through here, your main bedroom through there, blah, 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 and then you've got maybe a, um, you know, an en suite where you walk through. You might have your, your wardrobe through here, your walk in wardrobe through there, and then you might have, you know, like a wall like that, whatever. Um, and then you have uh, like a makeup area, powder room through there, and then basically you've got like your mi- main bathroom through there. That sort of stuff. You know, it's, it could be that sort of similar concept, whatever. But yeah, a separate area to do makeup and and look, you know, that sort of stuff can be an absolute wow feature. Um, for more expensive properties, if the space allows, then absolutely do that. And do a quick survey, ladies. If you had, if you were a buyer in the market, and you were in a main bedroom and you had a separate area to sit down and do your makeup with lights, would you like that or not? Abs- I would love it. Separate area to sit down. How frustrating is it getting up and doing your makeup in the morning, bending over the bathroom cabinet to see where you're doing your eyeshadow? Okay, so if I had a separate area that I could actually sit down and do my makeup in peace and quiet and basically with really nice lighting, then that definitely adds value. That's one way to get a woman attracted to your property. That's a wow feature in my opinion. But it's only appropriate to the value of the property. Um, my brother's just put in, I don't know where he's got it, but it's a space-saving plus water-saving devices. He's actually got the um, a hand bowl over the system where the system goes, so that once you've washed your hands, it replaces. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, no. I, I don't want my hands anywhere near the toilet. <laughs> I would definitely want them um, away. Would you agree with that? Yeah. yeah, I think most people wouldn't like that. All right. Change the shower curtains. I'm going to have to move. I'm going to have to move through these. And look, this this whole section is relatively. Um, 
um, self-explanatory, so I'll move through quickly. Add robe hooks to the back of the door, okay? Little, little dent, um, details like that. Um, get rid of the um, bidet, all right? You all know what the, the bidet, is that how you pronounce it? Bidet, bidet, bidet? Yeah, you know what that is? Okay, leave it till Europe, okay? It's not a big thing. Utilise that space to getting in a double vanity. That will have more value than a bidet, okay? Okay, bedrooms, let's look at bedrooms. That's Tempe. <sighs> yeah, they got creative on that one. Okay. Now that's my house that I'm renovating at the moment. That's the same house in Tempe. What are they thinking? I mean, it's actually quite nice. but just to That's actually a beautiful house, um, but it's just totally the wrong colour. So if you don't get your paint colours right, let me tell you, you're in trouble. So you're going to be dealing with these sorts of bedrooms. This is a before picture. That's an after picture. So what they've done is just basically taken out the, um, the wardrobes. They've replaced them with mirrored robes. They've painted, installed new furnishing and styling. Okay, so install new mirrored robes. Um, mirrored robes are absolutely great for bedrooms because what they do is they give the illusion of a bigger space in the bedroom. Um, you've also got to think about how other uses for those robes as well. So I'll let you um, figure that out. Um, install wardrobes, okay? So in more expensive properties, what I tend to do is I tend to take the robes to the ceiling. Again, it's you know, higher value properties. But what I'm doing there is I'm utilising. So this was from my pinball project where I'm utilising the space. The reality is what they're going to stick up there is their ski jackets in winter and, you know, some of that stuff, baby clothes, whatever it may be. So don't overlook those obvious um, sources. Okay, install ceiling fan. So in some rooms um, where you've got you've not got the budget to do ducted air and maybe you're doing split systems in the, the living rooms, then certainly ceiling fans are a great way to add value to a property and buyers will um, add, you know, they, that is definitely a perceived value thing. Okay, laundry, reduce the laundry if possible. So there's lots of opportunities for you to cut back the laundry and utilise that into a different area. Um, what I would do is if you've got a, so quite often you'll find that um, you've got your main, you know, your main kitchen like that, a lot of houses and you've got doorway through there and in a lot of places the as I said, the laundry is always tacked on to the rear, and they tend to be quite large rooms. Um, so over here, you might have a, like if you're looking at a normal bedroom, um, like a project home style, you might have a bedroom there. You might have a, you know, a, a lounge room or whatever it may be there through there. So what you can do as a renovator, what I would be inclined to do is actually cut back that laundry. So I would actually find some way of actually cutting back the laundry like that, putting in a doorway through there, What's that going to become? En suite. And by just slightly remodeling the kitchen, that could become a walk-in a walk-in pantry with a laundry behind a set of bifold doors, whatever it may be, or that can just become a, a you know, just a laundry full stop. It might become a laundry where you've got your bench, your doorway along there, and then you basically remodel the kitchen around that. So that's where I'd come through and do this. You know, you could either go down that way or you could just come through and do, basically do that. There's all sorts of things that you can do and that's why it's beautiful to doodle with floor plans. Okay, um, so reduce the laundry or relocate the laundry, okay? So um, quite often now it's more than acceptable. A lot of homes seem to be having a, um, a laundry now put out in the garage and you can actually have a clothesline out in the garage. So that's where you can totally take the laundry out of the house, put it into the garage, you mount the dryer on the wall, you have a little bench, a tub there, and it um, means you can just free up that area in the house to become something else. Some of these laundries are the size of a bedroom. Okay, so don't underestimate it. Okay, repaint the existing tiles or install new tiles in laundries. Um, install wall-mounted ironing board. Most people have a very cheap little gimmick, you know, cost you, uh, cost you $100, $200 to install a platform like this. But again, buyers will come through and they'll go, oh, that's a really good idea. So little cheap little wow factors, even low budget renos. Okay, let's look at structural improvements. Now, these are things that you can do internally. So we've already spoken about increasing the floor to space ratio on a property. So you're going to be going to go through and buy houses like this where you just, you know, underutilized block and you're going to go through and you're going to add to it doing alterations and additions. Okay. Okay. This is one of my early properties where I bought, you know, 70 square meter house. I came through and did an alteration addition and added an extra 700 square meters to it. Okay, 
So, um, and, you know, don't think you have to go and build these big monstrosities. They don't have to be, particularly in the inner city locations, you won't be allowed to do that. With a lot of alterations and additions you do, guys, they will always be tended, um, they will always be to the rear of the property, okay? So if you understand that, that's called a, you know, they're always set back to the rear. Okay, add to a property by utilising the building loan zone. Um, does anybody know what the building loan zone is? All right, so imagine we're birds flying over all the houses in the street and you've got the houses here. We'll do one more. <clears throat> so councils have a number of controls. There's side setbacks. Side setback is the space between the house and the boundaries of the properties on the side. Um, they also have a control, um, a front setback, basically at the front of the property. So have you ever noticed how all the properties are all in a nice straight line across the street? That's not um, by fluke, it's because of the development control. So they have that control about. They obviously control how high you go up. Um, so there's all different controls. So there's the front setback. So there's opportunity for you as renovators. Um, sometimes you'll find a house where it's like this. When I do the site inspection, I'll point this out. And if I forget, remind me to remind everybody. But there's one house um, only like literally 50 metres away where it's pushed back. So there's an opportunity to come in as a renovator and actually do an alteration addition to the front of the house in that particular property. So um, normally all the properties will be in a straight line. So this one here would be underutilised. So you may be able to get something there. But more importantly, what the building line zone is, um, councils draw an invisible line at the back of your properties. And if they, what they want in an ideal, what they want all the councils to be like Lego Lamb, where they all start they all stop and they all stop at the same line at the back of the property as well. So if you're looking down, it's like a grid, okay? That's what they want to aim for. In a real world, it doesn't happen. So what they do is they draw this invisible line like this of where they won't allow development at the rear to go past, okay? So as a renovator, this is why RP data is so great because you can fly in and you can almost pick where the building line zone is just by flying a bird um, above and looking at it from a bird's eye perspective. So as a renovator, you jump on RP data and you go through and you, you work out which properties are underutilised. So based on this diagram, we know there's an opportunity to go through and do an alteration addition to at least that point there this one, we can't, we can't do anything unless we can go up. There's no potential to go out, no potential there. And this one represe represents an opportunity to basically come through and do an alteration addition through there. I've got some examples to show you. So there's some reading notes in your manuals. Okay, have all this, look at, look at this um, property here. So this is um, just some properties. So where, if you look at this side of the street here, can you see how the houses are all sort of stopping at a particular... You can pick where the building line zone is. So sometimes in some streets where it's all over the place, it's really hard to pick, but generally you can see where that line is. So here, so the line starts there. So you've got to see where the majority of them are stopping and starting. Now, as a renovator, if you fly over an RP data, what it's saying is, see this house here? There's an opportunity to come through and do an alteration addition because the neighbour's already got one. So that's called a precedence, okay? So there's an opportunity for you to come in and do a big alteration addition through the back there. There's one through here. Like, look at these ones here. Um, see this one here? It's got a tiny little section. Now, as a renovator, I know that that's probably not going to be enough. It's not going to be a minimum of 30, 40 square metres, so I'm not even going to bother with that one. So what I'd be doing is I'd be going, yep, this is a deal there, this is a deal here. Look, that's been done, that's been done, that's you know, not got, really got no potential. This one's got a little bit of potential. All of these been done. So what I'm going to do is I've identified this one here, so I'm going to pull up on our, our P data what that property is, and then what am I going to do? go door knock them or put a letterbox letter, a handwritten letter saying, I'm interested in buying your house, okay? So it's being proactive. A question? Uh, so a microphone through here. I'll just, while we're waiting for the mark, I'll continue on. Okay, so you can, you can basically do an alteration addition that way to the side. You've always, always got to have your side setback. So if you've got three metres there and the side setback is 900, it means you've got an extra two metres to play with. Um, you can obviously go out, you can go up. So if you go out, you go up and you go that way. Where else can you go? 
down. And a lot of people, this is a big one that a lot of people overlook, is the ability to excavate down into the site to get extra space. Um, this is a property here, one of my early renovations, where um, I wanted to get a second story through there. Now, if I had gone up, if I hadn't excavated down, I'd come straight out. It would have been um, past the allowable height. So what I did in this instance was actually I excavated down into the ground. I was able to get a second story on with a sufficient, um, you know, quite a good roof height by excavating down into the ground. So obviously a bit more um, earthworks in involved in that, a little bit of um, uh, retaining walls and things like that, but definitely justifies the expense. Uh, just with the north facing um, uh, properties, you can actually build into your setback area uh, for north facing properties if you can show that it's um, for outside recreational purposes, which is actually allows you to extend your bedrooms and whatnot at the yep. back as well. Okay, great. So I guess the, yeah, the, the best um, aspect is obviously north orientation. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So um, now have a look here. What these people, this is actually a renovation that was done. Um, so I'll just look across here. So he, see here how they've had a normal block of land and they've actually excavated down into the ground to create double off, like to create off street parking. So don't overlook. Sometimes you just get a normal block of land that you'll think there's no opportunity to actually do parking when there really is if you put your creative hat on. Okay, utilise space to the sides of the property. So um, this is a um, for the people that came through my Mott Street property. Um, obviously, this is um, you know a dead. This is a, the 900 mil side setback. So who asked me about the side set? Somebody mentioned about side setback. But with the side set, so in my council, you have to be 900 mil off the boundary and not allowed to build. So that would be a dead zone, right? For most people, that would just be like a, a side path or whatever it may be. So I just turned it into like a water feature, utilising a dead zone. It had no roof and it wasn't counted. So that was counted as a landscaping sort of thing. So you can um, utilise those, sort of make something look better. Have a look at this house. I did, these people did such a great job on the renovation. Look at the, the difference. The same house. Okay, amazing. This is a house that was out in um, Glen Haven, out near Castle Hill, an average project home that was probably built 20, 30 years ago, you know, a house that would never turn your head. What they did is they actually had spare land. So they obviously had like, you know, five or six metres, whatever it may be, on the side of the property here. So what they've done is they've excavated down into the ground and they actually put a new wing on top of the garage. What they did is they actually converted the garage into living rooms. So they've just, they've just basically altered the internal layout and they've added by utilising the side space to the property. So don't overlook those. And this is particularly good if you're going to do renos out in the outer, um, in the metropolitan areas, not so much the city areas. Okay, bring the outside in environment indoors. Buyers love it when you do these big bifold doors, you bring the outside environment. So you definitely want to aim for that in your renovation. Look at this house, isn't it beautiful? Okay, it's because the, the outside is streaming into the house. These properties are absolutely beautiful to live in, so buyers love that. Okay, again, relative to the value. Change windows to door opening. Sometimes you're going to go through and basically you'll have a window in a wall and um, so you know, have a big wall like that. And when you're reconfiguring layouts, you want to get some access to the outside. So sometimes you can change the window openings where you come through, you just cut it down and you create that into a door cavity to lead out to the outside. So don't overlook those things either. So you see, just basically they, they cut it down, concrete cut down and um, basically take it out. Okay, reduce wall space with glass. Um, if you can, try and avoid, um, as you start to notch into more expensive renovations, you know, don't plasterboard everything in. So I, in my renovations, I use a lot of glass. People think glass is expensive. It's actually not in the scheme of things. So when you come out to my site inspection this week, um, all the doors, the windows, I've got a massive house full of glass, bifolds, doors, you name it, and the whole lot was $30,000. So um, it's actually not that expensive in the scheme of things. Um, so I look for any opportunities to basically um, cut out, you know, wherever I can cut out solid material and get light into the property, I always do that. Okay, convert part of the garage into an office, okay? So if you can't squeeze a home study, a lot of people these days want an office in their own home. A lot more people working from home these days, so convert part of a garage into an office. Remove the old fireplace. Uh, replace old windows, so you're going to come across some old windows that just don't work anymore. Um, for some windows that are in structurally good condition but they rattle, you can get somebody in to fix the sashes, so that's a couple of hundred dollars to do that. But definitely replacing old windows like this. Um, guys, just on windows, if your windows are truly in okay condition, they just look like this is an ugly window, right? What you can do with this, this uh, um, 
you know, white paint would solve this, would make, instantly make this window look better. And when you put things like white plantation shutters on or those white slimline Venetians, what it does, it drown, drowns out the actual appearance of the windows because the blinds are more dominant than the actual frame of the window. So quite often you can camouflage ugly windows for, for, with the window furnishings because you want to try and avoid ripping out windows wherever possible. Okay, add a grand entrance to the property. Um, I do this uh, wherever I can. So this is a home that I renovated in Pimble. Um, if I hadn't have put this big grand portico on the front of the property, it would have been a very average home. So if you can, you know, these grand entrances really can um, make a property look entirely different. And you can do this for low budget, like even renos out in the metropolitan suburbs, just normal project homes, by bulking up, putting some grand entrance at the front of the property can really change a property from an ugly duckling to quite an attractive property. Okay, have a look at this property. Okay, so just a beautiful portico at the front. It just makes, gives it more of an architectural feel. So for me, that's adding bulk and scale to the building as well. So it's just making something look more substantial than what it really is. So if you've got a normal um, project home, you know, standard project home, blah, blah, blah. You know, what I'd say is, can you do... And it doesn't need to be things like as elaborate as that, as that. You know, just, you know, can you even put something over the doorway just to, you know, dress it up? That's all you're doing is you're just tarting the property up. Okay, install a new roof. Um, add a carport to the property. So carport parking definitely, um, obviously, adds phenomenal value to a property. Um, carports definitely, in an ideal world, you want to add a garage, but sometimes your budgets won't allow you to put a garage in. So a carport, you can pick up carport kits these days um, for about uh, almost $3,000 where you come in and get a handyman to install them. So they aren't elaborate expenses and they are definitely a selling feature. So you can get some really beautiful carports these days. They come in all shapes and sizes. Um, you can see here this is a standard one that would cost you about three grand in a kit form. It definitely adds value to a property and you know you can go as crazy as you want with the carports. Um, if you actually smart with your carport in the design um, and get something a bit nicer they can almost double as an outdoor entertaining areas as well. So quite often you see people having parties under their outdoor carports these days. Okay turn a carport into a garage. All right, yeah, so I actually did this many years ago. Um, actually turned, uh, uh, basically enclosed the sides, um, put a roller door, adds phenomenal value to a property. Okay, add a garage. So if your budget allows, definitely adding a garage to your property will add value. In Balmain, if you have a double garage, you add half a million dollars to the price tag of the property. So in Balmain, if you have one car off-street parking, you add 180000 to the price tag. Two car off-street parking, quarter of a million, a double garage, half a million dollars to the price tag. So don't underestimate the power of parking, particularly in the inner city locations. It's absolutely prime. A lot of affluent people drive more expensive cars, and the last thing they want in inner city streets where the streets are tighter, they're always getting their mirrors sideswiped. Turn a garage into a bedroom. So um, what you can do is you can basically give the, turn the garage into another bedroom or you can make it into a rumpus room, all sorts of things. So it just depends on how creative you want to be. But if you're going to do that, don't ever lose your garage and have no garage if that's an expectation in your suburb. Have a look at this. This is just a garage. This is actually an overseas shot. I thought it was a good example. This is one of the ways I've plucked out this week. Um, but, you know, this is just a normal garage and they've actually given it a higher, better use. And they've obviously rejigged the internal layout and they've made it into a kitchen and whatever else it may be. So what they've done here is they've converted the garage into, you know, a living room, whatever it may be. So they've added onto the property and they've converted to the garage into a different use. Okay, add on a sunroom, okay. Um, utilise the existing space under the property. So this is particularly prevalent for all the Queenslanders in Queensland. Um, raise the roof up and utilise that space underneath the house, but only do that if the spend is warranted, okay? So what you need to do is you need to know what the resale values are and what you can get under that particular property. Okay, convert windows into doorways. Uh, I think we've already done that. Outdo add outdoor entertaining areas to a property. So Australians love... Um, sitting out in their backyard. So your objective with your renovations is that um, when you're renovating, you want to make sure, you know, let's say you've got your bedrooms up to the front here, blah, blah, blah. You know, try and where possible, get these big banks of sliding glass door or, you know, bifold doors so that they open up onto the rear yard. A lot of properties that you buy on renovated properties, they're going to have um, basically a little doorway 
at the back of the property and what you want to do is you want to basically increase that doorway and basically um, open it up so your out your house basically flows through nice nicely onto the backyard so a great opportunity for you to come in and you know add like a nice little deck there make sure the decks util, um, usable so that somebody can actually plonk a table and you know push their chairs out and not fall on the edge of the deck it's those little um, those all those little details that you need to be conscious of as a renovator okay so just think about how people are going to practically use it and leads it out to the outdoors all right install an automatic garage door okay um, add environmental eco friendly features now guys don't get too hooked up or too too crazy about all the environmental stuff that's going on in the market the reality is is that yes all those products are available and in some suburbs people will pay you an absolute price premium if you've got a greenhouse it's definitely an evolving thing but i feel the market is not quite there just yet in terms of your spend so a lot of the environmental features are a lot more expensive and I feel that at this point in time, you won't recoup your cost. Um, so in 10 years, though, I'm sure I'll be saying something very different. All right, external cosmetic improvements. I'll quickly take some... Uh, in fact, I'm going to hold off on the questions, if, that, if that's okay, and I'll come back to them at the end of the session because i really got to move through this session. Otherwise, we're going to be here till 10 tonight. Okay. Um, ex you're going to be buying houses like this, okay? So... All right, so that's the sort of stuff you can be dealing with, okay? Um, like this house here, you know, it's a post-war home. These are the sorts of properties that you are going to be dealing with. Um, with these sort of properties, I mean, look, let's, let's use this as an example, okay, renovators. What would you do to this property to radically transform this property? Render, render. Render, render would be my number one priority. What else? Balustrading. The balustrading, if you're on a low budget, could stay. What would you do to that balustrading? painted okay what else clean the what clean it no resurface repaint okay paving paint we're going to talk about that paving paint will totally trend that pr that pro um driveway is in structurally in perfect condition so you would gurney it and then we'd paint it okay what else yep tidy up the land see that tree see this tree here gone gonski um, what else? A new, a nice front door, absolutely. And that's probably all you need to do to that property. Uh, potentially, yeah. Now you're getting creative. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay, so let's have a look at some of these things you can do externally. So these are now, we're just focusing on cosmetic improvements. I mean, so these sorts of properties, yeah, you're going to... You know. Okay, first of all, wash the house with a pressure cleaner. So you'd be amazed at just a good old-fashioned gurney, how it can actually clean up a house. So have a look at this, before, after, all right? A lot of grime and stuff. Want me to flick back? A lot of grime and just mould and all sorts of stuff just grows over properties, just makes them look worse than what they actually are. A quick clean up with a high pressure cleaner um, will do miracles. I mean, you know, this house here just looks a bit grungy, looks you know, instantly better just from a high pressure clean. So, okay, uh, paint the house. So obviously, painting the whole exterior is a number one prior. That's the one thing externally that will make a massive difference and very cheap. Um, so you can see my student's house in Wagga, just an average sort of country house, just through new paint has made it look so much nicer. Uh, it's one of my early projects. See that? Just see the change in colour? All right, amazing paint. Okay, some Brisbane properties, just a new fresh lease of life with paint. Okay, repaint. So repaint the garage door and the carport. Um, this is a recent renovation that I did where it was actually a green and cream carport, which is a very prevalent common, um, colour scheme in Australia. So all I've done is I've gone through. So if you are going to paint the carport and the garage, make sure it's consistent with the roof colour, okay? So you want to just tie in the same colour in all ways, shapes and forms. Okay, spray paint the roof. Um, this house was spray painted. In fact, actually, I've just realised another way that you can add value that I haven't put in the manuals. See this here? This was just a normal project home, and what I did is I actually just got my carpenters to install some timber, um, timber, whatever you call it. Um, it's not really fretwork, I don't think. Um, 
Just timber strips, timber slats, okay? And then I just painted them the same colour as the house just to give it a little bit more of a... Um, so a little th those things are classic examples of you just dressing the property up, okay? Cement render. Now, cement render, as renovators, you're going to be dealing with cement render and it is absolute you know an absolute priceless way to add phenomenal value to a house so if i'm ever dealing with these red brick house it's my number one that's something if i've got 200 things i can do to the property that is something i will not give up because i know that's going to instantly transform um in sydney um you guys can use my cement render he's a magician at what he does um best render in sydney so if you need those details please phone the office we'll pass those on for you um i don't get any kickbacks or anything by the way guys so i'm just you know referring these people in good um good faith but these are properties you know where you know before ugly red brick house you know instantly looks better you know you're going to be dealing with these sorts of um early project homes that just look tired and dated would you agree with that just you know starting to look a bit shabby um you know gone in and rendered and painted so the beautiful thing about render is it's so um inexpensive this is my sister's this the, the renovation that i did in january was my sister's house it was actually a love job so i did it for free um I'm sure she likes having sisters like me. Um, but this was basically a before picture of the house. So, you know, a perfectly fine house, perfectly livable, but just a bit tired and then basically gone in and rendered it. So that was the house um, post-renovation. So that render cost me 3500 for the render for the whole house, okay? And it was done in about three or four days. So very quick and really high impact. And then I've come in. So that is my cookie cutter template, guys. I use it on my $2 million houses. I use it on my $300,000 house. I used it on a commercial office um, 10 days ago. So it just makes your life so much easier. Okay, um, look at this house. Ugly house, neglected, yeah? Okay. Oh, and there's no house. Oh, here it is. Look at that. And it looks like a completely different house. What have they done there? Let's skip back. They've rendered. They've uh, painted, they've paving painted the driveway. They've paving painted the stairs. They've actually come and put some landscaping through here. A big thing about these houses, they've come back and cut back all the ugly plants, okay? Plants make a house, unmanaged plants make a house look unruly. So they've gone done, and I think that's all they did. Let's, let's skip ahead. A uh, new spectacular front door, okay? So, um, and it's actually very similar to my cookie. That's a slim light range. I know that because I use that door myself. So see how they've come back and they've cut away all the ugly plans? It's opened the property up. So that's where you don't, you can get massive effect for not much money at all. Okay, put up a new front fence. Um, quite often, um, fences definitely add value. Um, this is one of my students, you know, the Wagga student where she's gone through, um, had a very, you know, just very simple mesh fence and gone through and put a substantial picket fence. She actually, uh, it's funny, she actually painted every single picket of that fence. Before it went on, she had like 200 pickets and she said, by the end of the renovation, she said, I never want to see another picket in my life. So uh, I said, well, I told you not to be the DIY, but don't listen. Anyway, so, um, and look, you can see she's used my cookie cutter template. So, you know, works here, works everywhere. Um, so, install perimeter fencing. So sometimes if you've got a really tight renovation budget, you know, you've got your block of land here, you've got your house through here. If you've got a really tight renovation budget, then it's okay to even just put a front fence to the rear. Um, you just want to put like a little, you know, like a little return on the side so it doesn't look totally weird. Um, but if your budget allows, then definitely um, a great way to add value to a property is, is to take the fencing to and at least that point. So quite often you'll have a gate to the side of the property. If you're on a tight budget, you know, bring the gates closer to the front of the house so you cut out that area there okay so perimeter fencing definitely adds value who's got kids okay would you prefer a house that has no friends or a fence fence families okay as renovators you're targeting families so always put yourself in the parents your mind. even if you've got no children you have to start imagining yourself having children that's reality okay so you can see uh, before picture after okay so security people want security in their house they want to keep thugs out they want to keep runaway cars out all sorts of things okay they want their kids to be able to kick a football in their front yard and not be hit with a car in the front street so they're all the sorts of things you've got to think about okay add a nice front door so um this is actually my door this is my you know even my cookie cutter doors i use them on low budget um, I use them on high, the same door, high and low budget properties, okay? So um, in this particular renovation, I took out the old security not security door. Nothing attractive about that door, is there? Yeah, they're real functional, but they look horrible. So as a renovator, um, I took the security door out that got sold, and basically my new front door got installed. That was a $600 door. 
okay, at a doorbell or an intercom system. Okay? You can go to Bunnings and buy doorbells for $30 or $40 these days, stick them on the front door, just another little thing that buyers will add value to. Okay, paving paint or stencil cream at the driveway. And you're going to be coming across driveways like this where they're just in perfect condition, but they look tired. So all you're going to do is you're going to come in and paving paint the driveway. In fact, I actually paving painted the driveway myself on this particular project. This was my sister's house. I actually did this on Australia Day. Um, I was wanting to get the Renault done quickly. So um, I used three tins of paving paint from Bunnings, $120 a can. I had really nothing to do that day. So um, basically got in there and, and bust my guts and swore I'd never do it again. Um, but yeah, you can see a massive difference. So this driveway was in perfect condition. But it, you know, when I went through and I cement rendered, I painted the roof, I painted all the carport, suddenly that terracotta driveway looked out of place with that house. So um, went in and colour matched the paving paint with the rest of the house and there you go. Okay, repave and um, replace and repave driveway. So sometimes your driveway is going to be kaput. You can't salve it. It's cracked. It's all. It's got movement. You can't do anything with it. So then definitely go and either concrete or, um, install a new concrete driveway or repave. It's going to be cheaper for you to repave rather than re-concrete. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, so, and it also depends on the thickness of the driveway and all that sort of stuff as well. Okay, add automatic security lighting. So, you know, when you're automatic, you automatically, you know, lights where the automatic light comes on, okay? You can get these these days for next to nothing. You buy them with the sensors automatically in. So, again, people will add value. Your lights are so cheap. Like these lights. You like these lights? Um, these ones are from, no, these ones actually aren't. If Bunnings had them, I would buy them there. But these are like $49 lights from Lighting Town or Auburn. They're, um, you know, aluminium look, so they look nice. They suit that house, low budget. So this is where you don't need to go and pay three or $400 for expensive lighting. Look for these cheap fixtures and fittings that look nice. And, st you know, stainless steel, aluminium look always looks good. Okay, add a add garden and driveway lighting. So you know the little the little lights are solar lights. You can get stainless steel little ones of those. Put them in. You buy them for next to nothing. Again, it just it's what it is. It's just little things, a whole um, collection of little things to make the house look better than what it really is. Add a security door to the front and the rear property. Okay, install a letterbox with the street number. See this letterbox. Again, this is my sister's renovation. This this is actually uh, guess where I bought this from. Bunnings. In Bunnings, they sell this litter box. It's actually timber. I think it was about $170. And what I did is I installed it. It was really easy to install. And all I did was basically paint it the same color as the house. All right, so you can rejig things instead of having to get something custom made or try and color match something. Install privacy screens. Um, privacy is a big thing for people. So this is particularly good in rear yards where you've got um, privacy issues with neighbours overlooking you. So these, timber ch these cheap timber screens are really easy to install. You get your carpenter to come in. So don't go and get these custom made. If you do that, it's going to cost you an absolute arm and leg. So bring a carpenter in for half a day, a day, whatever it may be. They will knock this sort of stuff up in next to no time for next to next. Okay, you can see here, what they've done here is they've tried to drown out. If they kept that wall, I mean, that wall needs to be rendered on the bottom, but basically if they hadn't have put that privacy screen on the top of the fence, you would have been able to see that's ugly red um, unit development straight behind. So what they're doing is they're drowning it out. So the privacy screens can be great from that perspective in terms of taking a buyer objection and, and minimising it. Add window shutters for security. Um, there's some beautiful shutters on the window. So again, people, a lot of people are security conscious. And so again, if you've got the options of window shutters, that's another way to add value. Um, window planter boxes, okay? This is particularly great for the inner city locations um, where you want that cutesy look. Chicks absolutely love these sorts of things. So uh, if you're dealing in a suburb like Roselle, for example, where heavily skewed to females, the pretty flowers in the plot, it's a girly thing that they like. Um, there was a house in Balmain uh, that went on the market about eight years ago and it looked like a gingerbread house. It was only three metres wide. It's in um, Clayton Street in Balmain. Uh, so you might want to even drive past. I can't tell you the number. It was sort of like heading down the street. If you drive past, you'll know what it is. It was um, a little gingerbread house, three metres wide. It was blue. It had all the decorative barge boards. It literally looked like a gingerbread house cake. And um, at the auction, there was just like an army of chicks fighting over this house um, because it looked cutesy. So don't, don't, um, don't underestimate those sorts of things either. 
Okay, in, ter in terms of talking up and dressing something up, finials and fret work. Okay, I did a video recently on finials. Did most of you get that? Or Okay, so when the new website's up in a couple of weeks, um, that one might have gone out about eight weeks ago. So when the new website's up, all of these videos will be loaded and you can pass the type password in and you can access all of them. But, um, you know, timber finial. So this is called a finial. Um, I use a lot of these. There's two of these on my current renovation that I've just installed. Um, so all of this sort of timber fret work, it dresses the property up and it's actually not very expensive to buy these things. So the finials that I've put on, which are almost identical to the, these ones, were about $50 each. You've just really got to pay. So they're very cheap in terms of the actual material and obviously you've got to get your carpenter to install them. But what they do is they just dress the property up, make it look better. Okay, add an outdoor barbecue area to the property. Okay, so don't overlook that. Um, add floodlights to the rear, rear yard. So again... $20 floodlight, again, a selling feature. Because what buyers are going to come through, they're going to work out, they're going to come through your property and they'll work out how practical it is going to be living. So if they keep going through different areas of your room and different areas and say, look, there's no wardrobes in this room and there's no lights on the rear yard and there's no deck out there, they're going to start, uh, they're going to basically start um, adding cost in their head as to what it's going to cost to get the property right. So if you can do this all for them without overcapitalizing, that's going to be much easier for you to sell your renovation project. Install a garden shed. Um, in inner city areas, it's always challenging to get a garden shed without it looking out of place. There's actually a garden shed in this yard. Can you see that? So see how I've used, I use a lot of timber screening in my projects, um, it's called Merbau, um, and so I use a lot of it to dress up ugly fences, so instead of going to the expense of replacing an old ugly fence, what I do if it's, it's in reasonably straight condition, I will just get my carpenter to come in, put battens on the, on the basically the, the fence and dress it up with this Merbau screening. So what I've been able to do is get a little shed in one of my properties here where um, little, just a little garden sheds, you know, it's about a metre in depth. And you can't really see, it's not a visual eyesore or it doesn't look like I've just plonked it there because I've, I've continued the same material around. Okay, install sail sails and shades. If you can't get a garage on, if you can't get a carport or you can't get an outdoor deck, you're over that FSR allowance, whatever, then don't overlook sails and shades as well. So they can definitely add value and they're very easy to install. They go up in the space of hours um, once you've organised them to go through. So just make sure you, mat you colour match your sail to your roof colour and your trims and your gutters and things like that so it doesn't look out of place. Um, outside shower and toilet, so as you start to notch up into more expensive properties or properties that are in the coastal areas where they're located, you know, those peninsula suburbs where they're close to water, then don't overlook um, installing an outside shower and toilet. Adding parking to the property, I've already spoken about that, so parking adds phenomenal value, particularly in the inner city locations. In the metropolitan and the country areas, this is not an issue, but the parking is definitely an issue. So what you want to do is have a look at this property here. This is not one of mine, this is an example I pulled from the internet, but this is a sort of average house that you're going to be dealing with. Um, now see this, this area here? Is this the sort of area that you would sit out with a deck chair on the weekend and have a beer? No, not, not unless you're really drunk, right? So um, what they've done here in this instance is they've actually taken out the retaining wall. They've pushed it back about probably about four metres or so. And what they've done is they've created off-street parking. All right? Now, if somebody did that in Balmain, they've just added almost 200 grand to the price tag. So don't underestimate powing, pow parking. Landscaping improvements on the outside. Okay, mow the lawn. Quite often, and cut back the plants, quite often you're going to be dealing with houses like this. It's not a jungle, this is an opportunity, okay? Quite often people just go, and this is the crazy thing, people go to these open for inspection and they just go, oh, too hard. And they walk out and they leave opportunity on the table for somebody like me to come in with a lawnmower um, or organise somebody with a lawnmower and basically just mow it and cut it back. So these plants are really unmanaged. That could be fixed, that yard could be fixed in less than one day. So don't underestimate these things. Now, um, with your landscaping, I also have a cookie cutter template for my landscaping as well. So what I do is I pretty much do this. If you've got a backyard, um, let's say you've got a front yard. Let's say you've got your house here. Blah, blah, and it continues on. Let's say this is your front gate here. So all I do is, you know, you might have a front path down to the front of your house. I have a really simple theory just to do this. So this is all turf, and this is just plants. Garden beds, plants, plants. So all you're doing is you're wrapping your, your landscaping around the perimeter of the property. 
really simple. You don't need to go and put a big fountain with Cupid spurting water out in your front yard, okay? Leave that for the weekend warriors, okay? So you can see here, I mean, this property is another classic example. Um, this property is a, John, this property is another classic example where they've just, you know, where they've just followed my exact cookie cutter template where it's just, you know, you're basically doing the landscaping to the perimeters. Don't underestimate the power of turf. People like grass. If you can make your front yard into a usable area for families to kick a ball around, fantastic. And obviously you want um, out through the back. So landscaping is the one area of the house that you spend the least amount of money, okay? My, my renos cost me less than $5,000 to landscape the front and the rear yard. So less, 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 okay? In terms of your plants really look around for places that you can buy plants i buy all of my plants from parkley tropical markets um, we actually are speaking to them at the moment in the trade group so um, yeah you can go to wholesale nurseries once you set up your new company okay remember i said you got to set up yourself you got to go out and set up your company once you set up a property development company you can you're technically trade and you can go into those wholesale nurseries and buy your plants wholesale. So don't start shopping at retail places. You don't need to do that. So your landscaping can be really simple. If you've done all your work on site, you know, this is one area that you can definitely pitch in and lend a hand if you've done all your work and you've got nothing else to do because landscaping is really low skill level. Okay, so replace or improve the grass. You're going to be dealing with unrenovated properties like this where the grass is perfectly fine, it's just neglected. So what you're going to do is go to Bunnings, get some lawn food and start watering it a couple of weeks before the property is going to come on the market. Now what happens in your renovations is, particularly with the front yard, um, what's going to happen is you're going to start getting pallets of things like tiles, paint, pavers. Your cement renderers are going to come and put their drop sheets on the grass or they're going to come and dump, you know, five tons of sand to do all some rendering. So quite often in your renos, your front yard can get somewhat destroyed. So what you need to do is you need to factor that into the equation before your sale period because what happens is if you don't just manage that, you'll end up with your front yard that has a big patch of dead grass through here and this will be really nice and green and lush. So you have all these, these this grass that's been damaged in parts. So if you can, try and restrict it to one area and try and get that area sorted like in terms of start getting lawn food or new turf put onto it a couple of weeks before your property goes on the market for sale. Okay, rip up the old concrete and install new grass. You're going to be dealing with a lot of houses like this. Um, a lot of houses like this in my area, in Leichhardt, all Italian people. Any Italians in the audience? Yeah, do you love your concrete? Okay, all right. So um, a lot of just different nationalities just concrete the whole backyard so as renovators you come in you jackhammer that up be smart about your waste with the concrete get the concrete recyclers to pick it up okay so you minimize your tipping cost um, and go through and replace it with grass okay install new plants and garden beds to the perimeter of the property so sorry that's what i've just just spoken about remove the old hills hoist now we have a sentimental attachment to the old hills hoist don't we do we not anymore okay it's gone um, so quite often you're going to go through when you're in, turn your, in terms of your internal landscaping you're going to go through these properties where they have the hills hoist um, in the backyard like that and what it does it actually cuts the backyard so get rid of the hills hoist what are you going to do with that sell it okay and what you want to do is you know those um, those clotheslines where you can mount them on the wall and you pull them out they're the best ones to basically target. You can put them in the um, garage. You can put them on a side of a wall where it's going to be less conspicuous because then people can actually run around and kick a football for a family member. Okay, install a water feature. Um, definitely look, installing water features add value. Um, don't go too crazy on water features. So if you can do it cheaply, um, go for it, but they definitely add value. So if you're going to install a water feature, do it in a key focal area. So if I was renovating a house, let's say I've created a house that... Um, uh, you know, I've got bifold doors to the rear like that, you know, bifold doors, and this is my rear yard. Where am I going to install the water feature? Straight here. So as you're coming through the house, you see the beautiful water feature right there. So if you are going to install a water feature, make sure it's in a key focal area that people are going to notice. And look, you can do lots of, you, you know, you can make your own water features these days. You can buy your own pumps. You know, you can make a lot of features with tiles these days, like mirrors, all sorts of things. Okay, install automatic watering systems. So for more expensive properties, definitely install an automatic watering system. Um, bulk up or raise the existing garden beds. I've just done this in my um, Claremont Meadows project. So see here uh, with my sister's house, they only had two courses of brick. 
so it was making the property look a little bit cheap and so what I did is I actually um, got my bricklayer in he raised the garden beds up two meters uh, two courses of bricks and then we rendered straight over so what it did is it actually bulked up gave the property a bit more of a bulky appearance appearance at not much cost at all Okay, um, turn unwelcoming areas. So this is a normal courtyard, okay? It doesn't really do much for you emotionally. Um, it's a, what I call a drab area. And what you want to do is you want to take that drab area and make it into a fabulous area. So little cosmetic changes like that that can, you know, basically... Nobody would want to sit in that backyard. Would you agree with that? And would you sit in there now? Yeah. Yep, just through minor cosmetic appearances. I'm finishing up. This is a, look, obviously a low-budget property. Looks horrible space. Still looks horrible, but it's better, right? So um, the reality is if you're on a really tight budget, don't think you have to go and create these architectural because the reality is if you've got a budget, you have to stick to it. So even if you can't do something entirely the way that you would like to, just try and pull out the big things that are really going to make the difference. Okay, add flood lighting to trees for effect. Um, add curb appeal. Everybody forgets about the out the property on the, the the basically the landscape. You know the curb, the grass on the curb. So if you're going to be selling your property, look after that area as well. So start getting the lawn food on that a couple of weeks before your property goes on the market, and you don't need to spend any expense in that regard. Okay, swimming pools and spas. Install a swimming pool or a spa. Now, um, in, obviously, in some suburbs, a pool does add value. I don't install pools in my renovation projects, but what I am a big fan of is the swimming, um, installing the swim spas. A, they're like a quarter of the cost. Um, reality is in my current project, I was quoted $50,000 by Crystal Pools to come in and put a very small pool into my project. I didn't want to spend $50,000. What I did is I bought a $16,500 swim spa that was the same price as the pool. I'm going to recess it into the ground so I've excavated the land. Um, all, all said and done will be $20,000. Now I believe that people, buyers, will place a higher value on that swim spa because it becomes an entertaining feature as well. So people, if I was selling the property, I would have that spa go Going, so people can come through the property and start visualising themselves actually sitting in that spa on a Saturday night having a glass of wine. So um, things like this. I mean, who, who would like this in their house? Hands up. Okay, so half of you. Why, why wouldn't you want... The people that didn't put their hands up, why wouldn't you want that? Maintenance? maintenance? Ma mainly maintenance? Yeah. Okay, cool. And children? You can get covers for them, security covers as well that are hard, but yeah. I understand. As a mother, I understand what you're saying. Um, okay, so you can see here this looks very nice. Okay, so at, you know, not much expense. Okay, repaint or install pool fencing. So if you're dealing with um, a pool area, um, definitely install new pool fencing or just resurface the existing. So just painting. You can paint colour bond, um, aluminium. So it's just an, an aluminium paving paint. Uh, sorry, an aluminium paint a primer that's put on and then you basically come through and paint it. Okay, um, repaint the swimming pool. So you're going to be dealing with these old pools in the rear yards where structurally they're fine, um, they're just a horrible colour. So you come in and you paint them and that's marine paint. You don't do that with normal household paint. Okay, you'll have a disaster on your hand if you do that. Um, you'll be swimming in some different coloured water after a little while. But yeah, and that's really easy. I've actually um, renovated a pool like that. That was actually my second property years and years ago. Um, I did that where I got in with the roller. So you can actually redo that whole pool yourself in less than one day. It's really easy with the big rollers. Okay, um, install new pavers around the pool. Okay, that can make a big difference. Quick development approvals. Um, obviously, adding a granny flat. Granny flats are a great way to distinguish your property from other properties. Um, there's lots of kit homes now in granny flats, so you can get a granny flat erect. Granny flat erected for like twenty, thirty thousand dollars these days. Um, so that's particularly good for families who've got troublesome children between the fifteen to eighteen year old range daughters, which I'm hearing all my friends are having issues with. Um, so yeah, this sort of stuff. Um, home office. A lot of people working from home. So a lot of these granny flats now can convert as a double as a home office. All sorts of things. In laws retreats. You name it. So this can be a little expense like this. Twenty, thirty thousand dollars can be the difference between people going, yes, I want to buy that property because I can shove my teenage son out there, whatever it may be. So don't overlook the power of granny flats. Some people even look at them as dual rental incomes as well. And subdivide the property if you can. So obviously a development approval um, improvement would be to subdivide the property if you can. Um, this is actually one of my friend's renovations. She actually made a million dollars profit on this reno. Um, she converted this house to this. 
looks entirely different, doesn't it? So all she did is she cut it down the middle there. She cut the guts right down in the middle. So she uh, did an alteration addition to the rear and she put a new front facade on it. Um, it's right, probably right here at the edge of that picture. So if you want to drive past, it's on Darling, 472 Darling Street, that particular property. Okay, rezone. So if you can, last, last thing, if you can, rezone the property. So if you can take the rezoning, look, it's much harder to do this, but not impossible, okay? So that's definitely another thing to do. All right, once you've identified, so they're, look, they're the basic, the 141 ways that you can add value to a property. Um, once you've done all of that, then it is time to... Um, crunch the numbers. So what you're going to do is you're going to identify on a room by room basis, you're going to go through. So I've summarized because there's a lot of stuff there. I've summarized on this checklist, the adding value checklist, all the ways that you can add value on a room by room basis. So go through and identify what you can do. And this is what you're now going to start to build your financial feasibility from. Now you're going to go through and you're going to crunch the numbers. You might find your feasibility is $40,000 over your budget. And that's where you're going to go back as a renov and get renovator and go, okay, what are the things that have to stay and what are the things that I can relinquish, okay? So that's basically their point that we're at now. All right, um, sorry, Lisa, where are we with? Okay, um, what we'll quickly do is we we'll quickly do the financial feasibility. So can I hands up, and we're gonna hand out the financial feasibility now. Yellow dot. Everybody with the yellow dot on the back of their card, can you please raise your hand and we'll get that raised up. Okay, sorry. Um, We've got two versions here. We've got PC version and we've also got versions for the Mac. So anybody that wants the PC version, like single people, if you've already got the feasibility, please don't put your hand up because otherwise somebody will miss out. So everybody who's on a PC, keep your hand up and then we'll do the Mac straight after the PC. So you only get one or the other, okay? So um, when you come to the, when you open the first page of the uh, feasibility, you'll come to what's called a quick links page. Now look, um, this is an Excel based spreadsheet. So basically you've got a series of pages right down the bottom of this spreadsheet. See them all down here? And what I've done is I've clumped all the costs according to the categories of costs. So you've got acquisition costs, um, project information costs, um, you know, building permit costs, all sorts, internal renovation costs, external renovation costs, and resale costs. So I've clumped them into those categories consistent with the um, resale calculators that we discussed yesterday. So what the Quick Links page does, it, it just basically gives you the ability, instead of having to come down here and scroll like doing this, okay, because there's, you know, quite a number of pages, it just gives you the ability to basically go in and jump to pages very, very quickly. So if you click on acquisition, it'll take you to the top. Of, so it's just a page you jump, you navigate between pages very quickly. If you want to go to the main menus, just go back. It takes you straight up there. Okay, the title page is that very first page of your um, financial feasibility, the pretty page, the orange page that you're looking at. You can actually take my logo off and um, put your own if you want. Um, so if you want to unlock the spreadsheet, the password is 123. Okay. I'm, I'm giving that to you in good faith. All right. Um... So um, regardless of whether you change your logo, it's still the, the spreadsheet is still copyrighted. Um, but yeah, so you can go in and, and insert your own uh, logo if you like. Now, um, so total page is just a pretty page that you print out for the banks and your spotters fees and all those sorts of things when you're trying to sell the property to somebody else. Project information page. Now, pretty much um, all the spreadsheets, all the cells in this spreadsheet are coloured. Anything that's coloured means it's fixed, it's locked. You can't change it unless you unlock the whole spreadsheet. And you basically type in wherever there is a white box. So, for example, the address might be um, 93 Hill Street. So you just type in 93 Hill Street, Leichhardt. New South Wales, 2041, don't mind my spelling. Number of bedrooms, three. Number of bathrooms, two. Number of car spaces, one. Year of construction, 1890. And um, other description, whatever it may be. Unrenovated, um, three better with structural reno opportunity to convert uh, to, you know, whatever it may be, to five-bedroom house. So you just type in a description because assume that um, your investor, if you're going to be doing spotters fees or your finance people, they're going to be reading that. So you just type in a very quick description. What price did you pay for the property? So I'm going to pay $950,000. Contract was basically signed on the 1st of the 1st, um, 2011, for example. I paid a $50,000 deposit. The deposit, I paid the deposit on the 6th of the 11th, um, 1st, 11. So it's just capturing some vital details about the actual project. 
Okay, project, when am I actually going to start the project? I'm going to start on the 1st of April 2011. I'm going to have the project finished by 1st of the 9th, 2011. Okay, so you just type in some basic details. You go down, who's your legal representative? So this is where I come through and type my lawyer's details, William Roncolato Lawyers, um, Paul Roncolato. Okay, his phone number, his address. So also instead of the finance people having to ring me asking those details, they're there on the feasibility and your finance guy. Okay, portfolios, finance, um, Paul Pritchard, blah, blah, blah. So it's really, that page is just an information page, so you only fill out the white cells, okay? Now, you skip across to the next page. Your next page is called your financial performance page. Can you notice how on this page, it might be a bit hard to tell from, oh, you can see it on the screen, but see how there's no white boxes on this page? So this page automatically populates all the data from all the other pages. So this is the page that tells you whether or not you should actually buy the property or not. So let's go through, we'll plug some um, dummy figures in here. Your first page of the spreadsheet is your project revenue page and basically what that is is all the money coming into the project so the money that you're going to be generating from the project so obviously when you sell the property you're going to be getting a um, sale proceeds so we type in here okay I'm going to be selling the property for 2.2 million dollars now can you see how you've got a budget column and an actual column Budget is what you're allowing and actual is actually the expense that you're incurred. So when you actually comes time to finishing your project and you're doing your post-project review, what it does, it actually pots the price variance column. So if you actually sold the property and you only got $2.1 million, for example, it'll actually say that you overestimated the sale price by 5%. Now, this is particularly good when you um, when it comes time to actually spending your money, your reno budget. And if you can come back, if you've got a cost blowout of like 350%, do you think you're going to make that same mistake on your next project? Next time you'll go, geez, I really underestimated the cost of excavation. Next time I'm going to have to build a lot more costs, allow a lot more money in my next feasibility so you can start to pick up where you got some things wrong just through this financial um, financial feasibility alone so basically what you do is you come back through and um, it's basically all the money that's coming into the project so you know even when you pay that um, your deposit to your um, when you pay for a property you sign the contract and you pay your 10 percent deposit or five percent deposit you earn money on the interest of that check so it might only be forty dollars but you know what it's forty dollars coming back into the feasibility so the more detailed you can you can become with this the better it is for you to know exactly how much money you've made on your projects. Um, you know, here you can see here, um, you know, when you settle, when you sell on a property, quite often you get a credit back from the water rates if, if the vendor's paid water in advance or whatever it may be. So $30 here. So don't think you need to go and fill in every single box you don't. You only fill out the ones that are applicable to your project. Um, here, you've got one here, refund of council public um, bond. So when you do a development application, the council will make you pay a bond. So, you, um, you know, in my year it's always like two and a half thousand, whatever it may be. So you'd put here, I'm going to get that money back. So you need to factor that in, in the actual project cost, and then it comes back to you at the end if you don't do any damage. Um, so you come down, um, so there's all sorts of things. So what it does, it automatically populates at the, at the end how much money you're going to get back coming in, that money. So the way this feasibility is structured, it's money coming in and it's money coming out, going out, and it basically works out a net profit margin right at the very end. See here it's got sale of demolition items. I know I'm going I'm to estimate that I'm going to sell about $2,500 worth of crap in that renovation that's going to come. Money coming back into the feasibility. So what that's done now, that's automatically populated that into that financial performance page. So what you do is you go through and you start filling out the categories of cost. This is the acquisition cost. So what's my property purchase price? Well, I'm planning on offering 950,000. That's where I know the value of that property should be. So 950 purchase price. I'm not going to have any loan establishment fee, no loan refinancing fee, no valuation. I know I've got to pay $32,874 stamp duty according to the government website. So you look up those stamp duty calculus. So it's very easy for you to work out all these costs. Um, I'm going to have a $60 mortgage registration fee. So I know I'm going to incur that. Um, I know I'm going to have to pay a transfer fee of $60 for that. 
Um, so you just go through and plug, you know, whatever. Even like down to the detailed level of, you know, when you have to do a settlement day and your lawyer will ring you up and say, Sheree, can you organise a bank cheque please made out to such and such vendor? You have to go to the bank and get a bank cheque. That bank cheque's going to cost you eight bucks. You build that into your feasibility so you know down to the dollar what you actually spend. So all you're doing is you're just going through these individual tabs where you're just going through and you're basically plotting out what cost you're going to incur. So this is a really detailed financial feasibility. Um, there is, it's, it will be impossible for you to ever miss a cost again. So the reality is you're not going to fill out every single line, but at least read every single line because you may not think at the moment that you're going to incur this expense, but you may actually incur it and you just don't know. So read every line to make sure that um, you just don't forget anything. So if you're going to doing a structural renovation, you know, your DA through your surveyor is going to cost you about $1,200. Um, your architect or your draftsman is going to charge you $6,000. Um, I'll be realistic for mine, $17,500 for your total development application drawing. So there's that. So I'm not going to get them to do any project management fees. So I'm just going in and I'm plugging in what cost. Development application fee, I'm going to be paying $1,700 roughly. Um, blah, blah, blah. So you're just going through. So you can see it's very, very detailed. You can make this as detailed or as generic. If you don't want to go through and, and itemize all these individual costs, you can just go through and clump them in one thing if you really want. So it just depends on how detailed you want it to be. Um, you know, owner builder permits. Yeah, I'm going to do this under owner builder permits. So I have to pay $90 to the Department of Fair Trading, whatever. Now, if for some reason, if you've got some quirky expense or there's something missing here, let's say I have to pay a fee to use the neighbor's driveway for a you know, two-week period because I've got no space on site. This is where you'd go through and put um, uh, payment to neighbour. So you can actually type in miscellaneous costs that aren't there and you'll just go through $100. Okay, So just capturing all those costs. Finance cost. This is all the costs associated with you holding the property. So you would go through, now you can do this a couple of ways. You can either just choose a monthly, like if you've got a flix, fixed amount, you just type in the fixed amount times the number of months, or you can just go in and put a flat free fee. So I know that um, uh, my mortgage, you know, based on the interest rate, is going to cost me 3,300 month. I'm going to be holding the property for nine months. Therefore, my holding costs are going to be 29,000. Um, you can break it down if you've got a taking out a construction loan. Okay, I'm going to be incurring some cost of 1200 a month by six months for the actual construction period. That's that. Um, you know, monthly, that's, you know, that $6.50 monthly account, you know, fee that you get charged, you know, that should be put in the feasibility so you can get right down to that detail. Property holding costs. I won't go through all of this, okay, because we'll be here forever. But your property holding costs, you know, you've got all your land tax, all your general costs like land tax, water rates, electricity rates, um, electricity disconnection, connection fees, they're all there. So these are some of the things that you guys would overlook if you don't use this feasibility. So please um, resist here. I've seen a lot of students where they just think, oh, it's just too big, it's too hard. And it's it's been designed like that for a reason so you don't miss costs. So quite often students, um, you know, and the reality is some of my students do multiple speakers courses where they've got their high level feasibilities where they just pretty much have 20 lines quite often when I go through those feasibilities I'll say you haven't factored in this 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 and this and this because you're using a high level feasibility so if you can this is a discipline and once you start familiarizing yourself it actually doesn't take that long you can literally do a feasibility in like half an hour using this detailed financial feasibility so it's a discipline what I do suggest is that when you get this initial feasibility don't try and work it out on the computer first like just familiarize yourself. So look at the paper version, read through it so you understand how it's actually set out. And it is set out very practical. Familiarise yourself with the paper version and then start to use it. So don't even wait to your first deal. Like just get an unrenovated property on the market and start doing some practice runs so that when you're ready to go, you're ready to rock and roll. If you're stuck, you call the office and the girls will talk you through it. Okay, so property holding cost. Um, you've got all your professional cost here. So what are your, um, you know, your consultant team, your design team, like your architect. So if you don't want to go and itemize all the individual costs in some of those other spreadsheets, you have, the, you have the option of just clumping them all through here. So here, if you didn't want to break them all down, you could go through and put, you know, architect 17,000 here, for example, okay? All right, so you go down, okay, I'm going to incur $1,500 with my accountant, surveyor, $1,200, whatever it may be. My structural, I know my structural engineering drawings are going to cost me five grand. My hydraulic drawings are going to cost me three and a half. I've got no geotech, no mechanical 
quantity surveyor, I'm going to allocate $850, no de development manager, no project manager. Now a very quick way to do this, um, if you don't want to go through and itemise your costs on a room by room basis for a structural reno, what you can do is you can actually just come in, if a builder quotes you $280,000 to come in and do the whole build for you, you can even just plug it in here, 200, I'll bump it up a bit. Um, otherwise I'll be have a really profitable project. Um, you know, type in there, 460,000. So you can be more high level if you want. The spreadsheet gives you that opportunity. Site establishment cost are all the things like your temporary fencing, which we're going to go through tomorrow. So if you have to hire, you know that you have to put a temporary fence around your site. So there's 1,200. Site office, I'm not going to have a site office. Shed hire, no shed hire. Site signage, $120. Need to buy some new signs. port -a I know port -a is going to cost me $60 a week. I'm going to be on site for six months. There's 3,600, whatever it may be. I'm just plucking these figures from the air. Okay, I'm going to allocate. How much am I going to allocate for tea and coffee? Five grand. Okay, so I just do that with my with my trade team. Um, you know, first aid kit, you always replenish your first aid kit at the start of every renovation, so $100 there. So all I'm doing is just going through and I'm allocating cost according to the project. Now where the bulk of the spreadsheet is, is in the re renovation internal cost. So how I've done this, I've done it on a room. So as I said, you can make this really, really detailed if you want, or you can make it as high level by just putting in the bulk cost in one of the other sections. So I've done it on a room by room basis. So what I've done is I've done, okay, the entry area, so in models or the other spreadsheets as well. So the entry area, and I've done it by the, by the floor, the walls, the ceilings, the windows, everything else in between. So you can do things, so for example, if we pick some tiles, let's say we've got an entry, a tile, um, let's say we've got a foyer, like an entry, and let's say the entry is one metre wide and it's seven metres long, what you're going to do in your feasibility is you're going to come here and you're going to go, okay, I need to buy some tiles. Now I know I've got one metre times seven metres, that's seven square metres. So I'm going to put a quantity of seven square metres there. I'm going to allow myself a budget of $50 a metre. I'm going to go out and buy some tiles that are $50 a metre squared. That's my budget, won't go over it. So I need to allocate a cost of $350 to buy the tiles. Now labour. So I've actually broken it down, materials and labour, if you want to try and get really down to that detailed level. Um, so here, you might say, okay, a good rule of thumb is that your labour costs tend to be the same, a 50% budget for your labour, uh, for your materials. So here, I would allocate a cost of um, $50 a square metre, put seven in, 350. So that, to tile that area should be about $700. So now this is going to be, I guess, out of the whole weak part of the system, this is the weakest part. Unfortunately, I would love to be able to say to you, for tiling, allocate this quantity, per, this price per square metre. It is impossible, and I'd be giving you a bum steer if I gave you that. The reality is, is that tradies, um, labour costs can vary by state, they can also vary by um, suburb, and they can also vary by the time of year. At Christmas, everybody goes in renovation mode, getting their houses quite um, spruced up for Christmas. So na tradies have a lot of work at Christmas. You know, post-Christmas, February, March, they tend to be quiet, so they'll have a, a more... Um, cheaper rate or they'll be more willing to do deals for you at those different times. So there's too many variables there to basically give you a chart saying allocate this and this. I, it's on my radar and I will hopefully develop something at some point but at the, at the moment that is definitely the weakest part of the system. So you know this is where if you can try and start getting quotes on things. Um, ring up a painter like a tiler in your local, just grab the local paper, ring up a tiler and say look what do you charge on average to tile? Now you're going to get some responses like well love how big's the job? Is it small? Is it large and that's another thing there's variances small jobs you're going to pay a higher price larger jobs you're going to pay so there's just too many variables to be able to give you that but if you can start look just ring them and say look I'm just trying to get a rough idea so I can allocate some money to do the job um, you know what is it should I be, if I wanted to tile an area that was seven square meters what would I roughly be looking at fifty dollars an hour sixty dollars an hour what would it be and so you'll get some tradies who just won't help you and then others you'll get some helpful tradies to say look just allocate this so there'll be a little bit of guesswork in that regard with some of your some of your stuff. So it basically goes through everything on the floor, everything on the wall, um, everything on the ceiling, the doors, like the door jam, the architraves, the skirting boards, the door stop, the door hooks, like absolutely everything that you could think of. So it's very, very detailed in that regard. You've obviously got all your renovation external costs, which is, you know, your tipping fees, your landscaping, your mini skip hire, your asbestos removal, excavation costs, you name it, it's there, foundation costs, roofing costs, pergola, carport, it's all there. 
Your resale costs are basically all the costs associated with selling the property. So you know you're going to, you know, most properties you'll be spending somewhere between three to six thousand dollars on advertising. You know your advertising cost. So I'm going to allocate five thousand there. My marketing costs will be um, um, same thing. Um, now agents commission. This is where you can actually type in the rate. So if your agent said, Sheree, look, I'm going to charge you 1.75, including GST, on an approximate two million dollar house, or 1.65, you type in 1.65, it automatically calculates based on the resale price that you plugged in earlier. Um, and you know, properties I need to allocate six thousand dollars to my property styling cost. Blah blah blah. If you're going to pay that substantial renovation tax, where you have to pay that um, that that tax to the government, you type in 10%. And they're going to basically factor it in there. Now that's the end of the spreadsheet. If you go back to the very page where it says financial performance, <coughs> can you see how it's actually populated all the figures now? So what it's basically saying is that you've got $2.2 million coming back into your feasibility, which is from the resale price and the sale of any demolition items, whatever it may be. Um, your property purchase price is $950. Your actual project costs, which are all nothing, you know, apart from the actual renovation budget, these are all your professional costs, are $609,000. You've actually got your construction. So I've actually put it um, in the wrong one. So what it does, it actually breaks up your construction budget versus your, all your holding costs and your professional cost. And basically at the end here it says the total project cost are uh, uh, 1.570 million. So that's basically what's, what the project is going to owe you. Um, your before tax profit is going to be 634,000. It's showing a 40% return. Now is that a deal? Absolutely. That's one you like to jump out of bed and um, try and see straight away. There's also a section here for after tax because a lot of you will want to know roughly what you're paying after tax. So what you do is you basically have the ability here to go in and put a tax rate. So if you speak to your accountant and say, look, um, am I going to be paying roughly 20%, 10%, 30%, 48 cents in the dollar? You can plug in a, a rate here saying 20% and it will basically calculate what your likely profitability is going to be after tax, okay? So what it's saying is that my after tax net profit margin is going to be 414,000, a 23% return and for me that's a deal, okay? At the end of the day, whether you do the deal, whether you buy the property will depend on one thing and it will be, it'll depend on these figures right here at the end. If it doesn't show, for a cosmetic renovation, if it's not showing at least 15% return, stay home, stay in bed. Seriously, um, if it's a structural renovation, you want to be aiming for 25% profit margin as a general rule. That's pretty much it.